Good morning, Facebook people. Uh, so here we are. We're live this morning uh, on another episode of Find Your Awesome with Awesomepreneurs. We have a really special guest again today, uh, our speaking and presentation coach, Ian Tyson. Let's welcome him to the screen, folks. There you go. Hey, Kyle. How are you, buddy? How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. Thank you. That's yeah, nice awesome to, to nice, hear. Nice so, to see your face and see you've shaved. Exactly. Eh? I got. I was COVID crazy there for weeks and weeks. And then I, I had an important interview with um, uh, pitch investors yesterday. Right. So I thought I better get gussied up for them before I uh, go on screen with them. So, well, and here, here I thought it was for me, but I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually like to start the show by thanking the frontline workers out there. You know, of course, uh, they're taking a beating right now. They're special people. They don't normally get recognized in the normal world. And when COVID hit, you know, they're the real heroes of today. So I want to give a big shout out to them. And I want to ask you, and how are you struggling or how are you making out with the situation we're in today? Well, I mean, on the on the business end of things, it's certainly been a struggle. But uh, I'm I'm trying. I'm as you know, which is on brand for me with what I do with speaking and everything else. I'm uh, I'm just working to stay positive and focus on the things that I love and the things that bring me joy, and then trying to uh, you know find the opportunities that exist within all of those. That's that's really where I'm going. But I'm generally uh, feeling pretty positive. Look, we all have our good and our bad days, and everybody's allowed to feel the way they feel through all of this, because it's a unique uh, position to be in for everybody. So, you know, as a, a friend of mine said at an event, uh, a digital event that I was part of a couple of weeks ago, it's not that we're all in the same boat, we're all on the same body of water, but everybody's boat is different. So that's, and my, my buddy Stu said that, that's a, and it's such a great point. And uh, it, it's true, we're all gonna be processing this in different ways. And, um, so I, you know, I'm just leaning in on, on different things that, that make me happy and, uh, seeking to pivot within the business end of things, but just doing stuff that's going to keep my positivity up, which is what I'm all about. That's awesome. I love that. And that's who I've decided to surround myself with is people like yourself that are looking at the positive side of things. There's so much negativity out there nowadays that it, it gets draining if you keep watching it day in and day out. Oh, absolutely. So Oh, I'm, I'm really careful with who I allow into my circle these days. And I have a lot of special people around me, you being one of them. Now, how has it affected your business? And how have you had to navigate through that and change what you are doing? Is it a big change? It's been a big change. I mean, how it affected the business was literally within a few days, all of my gigs that I had for the foreseeable future were gone. Um, and I've had over, you know, I had some conferences that I was scheduled to do in the fall that it took a few weeks, but they've now, you know, either uh, moved by year or canceled outright. So it, it's been a it's been a big change that way in that my income went away. I'm thankful that we live in a country where we're getting some some good support and that's great. And then the rest has been having to pivot towards the way I can still do my do the job, do the thing that I love but do it differently in this new world. And that's why I've now, you know, got the sort of home studio set up and uh, got myself set up still, you know, working on tweaking things like lighting and mics and all of that. But this is how I'm delivering keynotes now. So I had to do the same thing. I'm yeah, right there with sure. Ian. It's been a big, huge adjustment for everybody. But I know in the speaking world, it just absolutely crushed it because you know, you guys are used to standing in front of thousands and thousands of people sure. and all of a sudden, boom, that's gone away. So has it kind of affected um, how you feel about your value in the world and how you value yourself? Did you struggle with that? That's an interesting question, Kyle. And I don't know that it did. I mean, certainly there's always, you know, you've got to have a, a period of time to adjust to this, you know, this news and, and the change that, that has happened. So there was a few moments where it's like, okay, ugh, what, what do I do here? But if, uh, as I've tried to do, tra staying true to yourself, then if I'm confident in the fact I still have more to say, I still have things that I think people want to hear just the way that I deliver it to them is going to change. Then I'm going to be okay as long as I'm staying true to myself in that way. And that's, that's really what I've tried to do. I've said uh, one of my best friends that I 
talk to all the time. He and I always talk about this, this sort of theory that I've kind of leaned in on during this time is focusing on the things that reflect and build my core being, the stuff that makes me who I am. I call it the, my three pillars. So the three pillars for me are one, sort of the motivational, positivity, optimism, speaking end of things. And so I've tried to be really intentional with the, um, with, with the content I'm putting out, whether it's a post on Facebook or, or Instagram or other socials, maybe putting out a video, sharing something that's positive, being really intentional about that, and also doing the work that needs to be done in order to pivot the business so that I can do things like this. Two, as, as you well know, the second pillar for me is cooking. Uh, I love cooking. It's how I relax. I, you know, it breaks my heart that you don't, and I'm, I'm going to get you, buddy. You're going to, you're going to learn some stuff. So I'm doing, hoping, buddy. The, the, and doing things like, uh, like the, the web show, the cooking show that I've started and just chasing opportunities that may exist in there. And then I'm also, as you may be able to see in the background behind me here, I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd and I love my nerdy stuff. And so I've been focusing in on that as well. And those are three things that really make up my core being. And so I feel as long as I'm being true to those things, the path will present itself. It may not be the path I was expecting, but I'm staying true to who I am and seeking the opportunities. I love it. That deserves one of these, buddy. <laughs> that gets an applause. <laughs> Listen, before we go on too far, I want to make sure everybody gets is able to get a hold of you, Ian. So sure. we have a ticker at the bottom. What's yes. the best way to get a hold of you? What's your email? Uh, well, you can email directly at uh, hire underscore me at iantyson.ca. Higher. Um, and now we're watching Kyle type in real time. Yeah, so and you know great. me, I'm a computer idiot. So <laughs> higher <laughs> underscore me. At iantyson.ca, not dot com, dot ca. That's beautiful. So yeah, I want to make sure that everybody's able to get a hold of you, Ian, because you've been a, you know, you're an instrumental part of the Awesomepreneurs coaching team. Let's talk about that for a second. How sure. important do you feel the skill of speaking in front of people is when it comes to the business world? Well, I mean, that as a skill I think is vital because whether it's you're presenting to employees uh, as, as a business owner or fellow employees, you know, as, as some type of presentation, you're, you're speaking at a friend's wedding, you're pitching to an investor, whatever it may be, the ability to speak in front of people is a huge skill. And it's one of the things that I like to be able to teach when I have the opportunity with people within the Awesomepreneurs community. But what's interesting is even during this time is taking that skill and pivoting it. Because one of the thing that's one of the things that's tough, and I've spoken to a lot of my friends in the speaking industry, is people who are having trouble doing this, looking at the camera and still feeling like you can have that connection and do something relatable. So it's people gotta are, be really hard when you don't have the reaction of the crowd, like when you don't have the applauses, or you know, maybe sometimes somebody would get the odd right. <laughs> yeah. It's well, got to be a lot tougher, right? Yeah, because you don't know how people are feeling. I mean, sometimes if it's on a Zoom or a BeLive or, you know, Microsoft Teams or any of these different programs, you may see a few faces on the screen in front of you. I mean, I know when I did that uh, keynote for the live uh, live streamed Awesomepreneurs event right after this first started, I was grateful that I had you and Jenna on the screen in front of me. So I at least had a couple of faces to react to. But uh, th the thing that we've that you've got to do now, and this is maybe the toughest part for some people in the industry, is coming to that realization with some of your material. What what this equalizes is who is that that piece of your material for? Did that laugh have a purpose or was it for you? And if it Absolutely. was for you now, we've got to change it and we've got to see. Am I doing something that's impactful? Am I always doing something that's trying to connect? Because building that connection or hoping or assuming you've got that connection through this is a whole different thing. But that, and you've got to almost train yourself to look at the camera, not at the screen where you are. It's a natural tendency to want to, you know, look at, oh, there I am on the screen and see me. But no, you've got to look at this camera and there's all these little tricks. Like I have people in the speaking industry that have been giving all kinds of tricks and tips. And the one that I do 
and I think I told you about this, I literally have a post-it note on the back of my laptop right above that camera with a smiley face on it. So it reminds me, one, to look at the damn camera, and two, to smile when you're doing it. Because this is what I would do if I was on stage, is try and make eye contact with people and smile when I'm delivering the material. So this is the way I make eye contact. Absolutely. And I, I just want to reiterate the importance of the skill of speaking. Um, oh, for was, sure. Oh, man. It was something that I struggled with for months and months when I started Awesomepreneurs. Uh, and it's just, it's a skill that the more you do it, the better you do get at it. For sure. And any tips and tricks that you can give our, our members is incredible right now. And they can reach out to you directly. But did you find it? Let's talk about that again. Did you find it a struggle to adjust and change from the real world to the tech world? It, um, was it a struggle? I mean, I've thankfully, I had had the opportunity to do a few virtual presentations before. Um, I've had a, a couple of things where uh, I think it was a year ago, I did a keynote for the Board of Education in Toronto. And there was about 60 students on a Skype call. And I was presenting to them. And, you know, that was tough the first time. I could see some of their reactions, but if that's the other downside. If they're on their phone or something, they're not paying attention. Oh, you can see that too. Uh, but that's also a reminder that when you're on stage, the thing people don't realize, even in, in a crowd of a thousand people, oh, I can see you. Yeah. People who are on their phone in the crowd, you think I can't see you. I can see you. But, it's, but not being able to see anybody in some of the cases where you can't see anyone or have any reaction, yeah, that took a bit of a pivot. And again, it's kind of this mental thing of you have to let go of some of the material and the reactions that were simply for you and focus in on the quality of the content that you're putting out. And is it impactful? And it makes you change the way you say some things. And you may speak a little quicker because you're not getting those laugh breaks that maybe you normally would. So there's, there's a whole, there's a bunch of adjustments and I'm continuing to adjust to it and, you know, adjusting with, you know, trying to have good lighting and an interesting background and all these different things. But in terms of material itself, I'm finding that it's, it's, it's making me really lean in on the quality portions. Like what's the real good meat of it? Because the other thing I'm finding, and I'm not sure whether this is going to be an industry standard or not. But of the handful of things that I've been able to book, and as I move forward, continuing to try and book presentations, it's for shorter lengths of time. Yeah. So I just booked a, a gig that I maybe wouldn't have normally been able to book. Uh, next month, I'm the opening keynote at a conference in Poland, but wow. I'm going to be doing it virtually like this. It's an opening keynote, which in most cases would be a 60 minute at least type of scenario. They want 20 minutes because holding people for that long on camera, one person talking, no Q and A, nothing else is going to be a little bit tougher. So that may be the standard, maybe getting into more of the 20, 30 minute. So you've really got to trim the fat and get down to the essence of what you're talking about and make sure that the content you're putting out is going to be, you know, something impactful in a short period of time. And frankly, I, I love the challenge of that. I like, I like an assignment. I like working within confines where people are like, okay, do this, but you can't do this, this, or this. Give me some confines. I love trying to make the most. That's why with the confined kitchen, the, the web-based cooking show that I've been doing, I, I have a very small kitchen in my apartment, but I love trying to create amazing things within those confines. And we are also all now confined. So take up that challenge. What can we do within these confines? What's the magic we can create? That's amazing, man. I love hearing about this kind of stuff. Now, I want to play an honesty card here. It's really okay. easy for everybody to pretend that everything's sunshine and rainbows and we're all, you know, doing well. Have you struggled from day to day yourself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've had moments of deep sadness. I'm I'm a very social person. And I mean, the only person since the 13th of March that I have hugged has been my girlfriend. Yeah, I'm fortunate enough that we're doing a lot of our quarantining together. She goes back to be with her daughter, but we're following all the protocols and being real good about it. But you know, I've I've had a couple of socially distanced walks with friends of mine, but I couldn't give them a hug. 
and there's something about the you know the way the the serotonin that that does and how it lowers your cortisol and what a hug can do for your mental health not having that has been tough and I mean, there have been moments of emotional reactions that I wasn't expecting. Like, for example, and this is A, super geeky, and B, a, a little strange, maybe, I don't know. But I was, you know, watch a lot of movies, watch a lot of things. Uh, I was watching Avengers Endgame for about the sixth or seventh time that I've seen that movie. Saw it probably four times in the theater last year when it came out. But I was watching the movie and at a, I won't spoiler it, but at a pivotal moment at the end where we lose somebody... And again, I've seen this movie like six, seven times. I sobbed. Yeah. Like uncontrollably because there was a lot of emotion built up that I needed to let out. And you've got to have that outlet and it's okay to cry. It's okay to be sad. But as I talk about in some of my presentations, like one of my my life mantras and once we're able to get open back up again, I'm going to my tattoo guy in London and I have a new tattoo that I'll be getting on my forearm that will say pain is inevitable. Misery is a choice. Bad stuff's going to happen. It's how we choose to deal with it when it comes because it is a choice. Do we respond or do we react? Having that reaction is okay as long as you take a moment and take a beat and then are still able to respond to something in perhaps a more positive way. But if we make 2,000 choices every single day, which most people do on average, we can be in charge of those things. We feel very out of control right now in this time. So why not take back the control over something that you can control, which is your choices every single day and the choices in how you respond to things. But yeah, I've had my bad days. Like just because I'm a motivational speaker doesn't mean that it's always sunshine and rainbows. I've had a rough go in some of these days. I've had days where I just need to shut the world out and just, you know, stay in my pajamas and watch movies on my couch. I've cried, I've been sad, but more often than not, because it's a choice and because of the practices that I put into place, I'm having good days because I'm, I'm getting my sleep, I'm trying to eat well, and I'm getting exercise. Those things are huge. Yeah, it, it's it's been shocking to me as well, too, the emotional roller coaster that this whole thing has taken us on. You know, yeah. I'm generally an upbeat guy and I like to stay positive. But again, it's okay to have those those days where you're down and you're not feeling like doing anything. And and lately what I've done is I've just shut down and given my body and my head a rest yeah. uh, and tried to recuperate. Now, with that do. being said as well, Ian, is there any new skills that you've learned during COVID? Because for me, it's just been a phenomenal experience to be able to sit back and learn new things that I never did before. This podcast would have never happened. Sure. had COVID happened because I kept trying to push myself to do it. I couldn't find the time. Now I've got the time. Is there any new skills or stuff that you've picked up? Well, certainly all of this tech stuff. Uh, I mean, I've been, I've been constantly tweaking for the past several weeks and even just this morning coming on for this, like I, I've talked to a buddy of mine who's a director. He directs, um, he's directed his own independent horror movies and does some media content with, uh, with a company that I used to work for a while, CC. And uh, I called him up before I was actually doing the Awesomepreneurs keynote, uh, doing that live keynote. I said, okay, here's the space I'm going to speak in. Here's what I've got for lighting. Tell me what I need to do. <laughs> and so he was giving me tips about having a key light and lighting your background and all these other things. And then I did that out in my dining room and I, when I spoke for, for awesomepreneurs, but I realized moving forward, I've got to have a space I can quickly convert instead of the big change I did out there because the light was a little better. Um, so I, I made it here in my office. I already had a standing desk, so it's easy for me to, uh, you know, just lift my computer up a little bit higher so that the the camera's right there at eye level. And then need it, use, took those tips he had, and I'm still continuing to tweak with the lighting. And I know I, there's a couple more little lights I want to go buy, and I've bought a little microphone that I use when I'm doing my my cooking stuff. And yeah, there's all it's the tech has been a big skill for me, and that and maybe not not relearning but reappreciating things like um riding my bike uh i i i was i used to run but my my feet and my knees are terrible now so i can't do it and i can't go to the gym i can't go see my best friend and we we used to box three times a week as the exercise but we can't do that either so i went and got a used mountain bike and i've been now 
rediscovering the joy of in the nice weather and even when it's not great of getting out and just going and riding my bike for like an hour or an hour and a half as a way to decompress it's been great that was my bad sorry i was playing with the tech see it's that tech they, stuff you're tricking we're, us we're again. learning kyle we're all learning man absolutely sure. so let's hear let's let's have another honesty moment here what do you Please. think honestly the speaking world looks like going forward uh, and from what you've heard from all, I know you're really, really involved in the speaking community and you have a lot of friends involved in it. What's the talk around the speaking community and what it's going to look like going forward from here? Does anybody know? Is there a lot of uncertainty? Are they scared? Well, What's the feeling around it? Well, that's the thing is nobody really knows. So we've got to take the data that we have and um, and then being able to uh, being able to take that data, kind of put it through the filter understand the source that it's coming from and know that things are changing all the time. What I could say best guessed from the things I've heard as far as like conferences, large groups of people coming together, it's going to be at least a year before I'm going to be standing on a stage with a mic in my hand, actually speaking to a group of people. I think now, it's going to be at least a year. Like we're talking spring 2021, probably though more like, fall 2021 like there are some big groups that are in the know like you look at ted that do the ted talks i know i were i was uh received i saw a post in a group that i'm a part of that's all motivational speakers and and inspirational speakers and business speakers and one of them said you know received an email from ted that not only did they cancel their spring event in california but their large event that they were doing spring 2021 in vancouver They've canceled. Wow. Because they're that's saying so like, mind blowing. I mean, for the large groups, that's going to be the last thing to come back. So you're talking sports, concerts, conferences, the absolute last thing to come back. So we've like, it's literally got to be, we've got to have a vaccine before those things are happening again. So for me, whether it's with corporate or educational clients, then I've got to pivot to be able to say, yeah, I can, I can do this. I, I can I can speak like this on camera. I'm good. The pricing may change a little bit. Like we said, the length of the presentation may change, but being able to say I'm ready. I spent a couple of days last week doing changes to my website so that it reflects the virtual world that we're in, showing samples of me doing this, pictures people took of me speaking on their computer screen for a, a virtual event I did a couple of weeks ago. I used pictures and screenshots from when people watch me on Awesomepreneurs. That shows proof of concept. This can be done. We don't know what the market's going to bear in terms of pricing, but, and nobody knows. So it's kind of the wild west. You've got to go out there and figure it out for yourself and see what you can do. That works into my next question, actually, Ian, because one thing I'm struggling with right now is there's so many people giving away everything for free online. You know, because of the times we're in, everybody's trying to be the nice guy. They're giving away free courses, free talks. How is this situation going to change the pricing? If there's other speakers watching right now, and again, we've all mentioned the, the amazing speaking community you're involved in. What's everybody doing with their pricing for keynote talks and stuff? Because you can't charge the same amount of money as you would as if you were live on a stage. Well, it's interesting. It has been kind of all over the map. And I think it depends on the person, on their reputation within the business and the the kind of money that they would normally command within the business. Um, I mean, I just saw a post yesterday from a friend of mine who since March 11th said he's done 116 virtual things. Holy smokes. Now, a lot of those would have been free. A lot of those might have been things with past clients. But, uh, and again, with some of the conversation that I see out there in the industry, some people are doing full rate. Some it's like half. Some it's, it's even less than that. It kind of depends on the scenario. I mean, a lot of the speaking that I've done over the years has been at schools in the educational market. So they certainly have money for these things that they've not used, but they're going to save a lot because if I'm doing a speech for a school in BC, they don't have to pay for the travel anymore. Yeah. This thing I'm doing in Poland next month, they don't have to pay for me to fly to Krakow. So yeah. it makes it a lot easier and it can be quick and I'm done. And I might, it's maybe more looking a thing like working in volume. So I may not still get the same rate, I might, but I mean, what I'm getting for a 20 minute keynote in Poland, if you, 
uh, you know, extrapolated it out to what an hour would be is not far off what my rate for an hour would be. Yeah. So it's not bad, but so maybe these bite sized things with smaller, uh, you know, smaller dollars might be the way to go. Everybody's going to have to find their own way in whatever their market is and see what that market's going to bear. Um, yeah. And there's all kinds of different ways to do it again in conversations with people in that speaking business. Um, there, there are some people that are just thriving through this because they were able to quickly educate themselves on the tech end of things, make it work and, uh, and, earn, and, you know, change up their stuff. I know there was a, uh, a speaker friend of mine who's part of that group who took a three day course that he had normally done, converted it to a five hour online course. And he was doing it for a quarter of the price, but selling a ton of them. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a volume thing. It's going to be different for everybody. I'm still trying to figure out what the market's going to bear in terms of my stuff. But, uh, you know, we'll see. I'm w Obviously, I'm flexible. I'm willing to play ball a little bit more now as opposed to being set in my, in my rate because nobody really knows. All I know is I want to be out there doing the work. And if it means I'm doing, you know, 10 presentations in a day where normally I'd do three if I was super busy, those would be three one-hour presentations. Maybe I'll be doing 10, 20-minute ones and I can walk 10 feet and be in my kitchen. Like that's not bad at all. I yeah. don't have to leave my apartment. I don't have to stay in hotels. I don't have to take flights. I don't have to rent cars. It brings the total cost down a lot more. So we're just going to have to see. But there's been, I, I was part of a student leadership global conference a couple of weeks ago where they had 34 speakers over two days. It was a free event, um, but 6,000 people from around the world signed up for it. I was there. I saw it. It was awesome. Yeah, you were watching. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And yeah. now, you know, they do, that's a good proof of concept. Hey, we can do this. Hey, we can put good content out. So what they're maybe going to do next, who knows, there might be something that's, you know, a, a paid thing they do for another live event or another way to deliver material. That's, that's what we've all got to do is adjust accordingly. But again, if you stay true to those things that are truly you, that's what you're putting out there. That's what your content is then that the, it's going to work itself out. Yeah, here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We're going to have some Look fun. So I want to make sure, Ian, that everybody gets to know exactly who you are and what you're all about. Sure. Why don't you talk a little bit about the book that you wrote? Do you have a copy of the book close by I that you can show right, us? Hang on, right uh, here. There's That's my book. Awesome. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about it? Sure. Well, just for those who don't know, I've been a professional speaker for just over 31 years now. I started in 1989 when I was 18 years old. First school, first paid speaking gig I ever had was at John Paul II in London. And um, so I've been, I started out as a student leadership guy, was going to student leadership conferences, ran my own conference in London, and, you know, was always kind of an upbeat, sort of on stage kind of guy. And that led to, to me starting in the educational market and now also doing stuff in corporates, but for the better part of 31 years, making my living, getting up and speaking to people. So this would be six years ago, I wrote this. Um, I'd always, for years, I'd wanted to write a book and I didn't know whether it was, you know, a biographical situation. Is that like sort of feeding the ego? What was it all going to be? Um, what I ended up doing was I just started writing stories and think of the different stories and ideas and thoughts as chapters. There was no particular order when I first started writing it. Then when I took a step back and looked at everything, it kind of fell into four categories, which is what I put the stories in. So the book is called Hooray for Everything, The Optimist Manifesto. So hooray for everything is the title of one of my presentations. It's one of my life mottos. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> I love um, it. It's, it's one of my life mottos. And uh, so what this really is, is, is a book with, with different types of stories, all about finding and holding on to positivity in different ways. So the four sections that I broke the book up into were the first one is the per I just called the pursuit of happiness. So it's all about trying to find happiness, trying to find positivity in our world. The second part was called, uh, was a little lift from Dr. Seuss uh, from Oh, the Places You'll Go, where the second part is called Except When You Don't, because sometimes you won't, to talk about how to really 
lean in on that positivity during the tough times. The third section I called Tales of the Optimistics because I put it out on social media at the time I was writing this for anybody who followed me on social media to send me a story of how positivity got them through a tough situation. So I have a bunch of stories written by middle school, high school students, college, university, business people, teachers, parents, put all of those together. And then I called the last section the toolbox, which is just really usable, practical tools you can use to find and hold on to that positivity in your life. That's amazing. And, and I have so much respect for people that write books because you know what? They're honestly timeless. Like that's something that's going to be around forever. The fact that you said you wrote it six years ago doesn't even matter because it's still no. relevant today. It's going to be there forever. How long did it take? Did that process take for you? Did, was it a long, grueling process? Well, I, I mean, I guess that depends on whether we talk about all the, the amount of time I spent hemming and hawing about whether I should write a book or not. A lot of the stories had been floating around in my brain for a long time. But I think when I actually said, OK, I'm going to sit down and write this from that to and I, I self-published and self-edited, had a couple of other people take a look at it. But after my first run, I did have somebody who bought a book that said, hey, I found a bunch of spelling and grammatical errors. You want me to send those to you? And I said, yes, please. Um, and then corrected it. But I would say from beginning to end of process, it was about a year and a half, like 18, 18, 20 months, somewhere in there. And it was a labor of love. And it was really just getting all of this stuff. Some of it was material I delivered on stage. Some of it was just things I think about you know, that are, That's that are wandering around in my brain and just writing those things out because I did it in these little sort of by chapters, I could just crank something out in an hour, write a chapter or two, and then walk away from it for a couple of days and then write another one because it didn't necessarily have a start to finish narrative structure. I took all these things once I wrote them and then jangled them together to make these sections because I realized once I started looking at the stories, these fell into categories. And that's how I came up with the categories and chapters then for the book. So that that was kind of the whole idea. And it was fully self-published, eh? That's impressive in itself. I love that. How yeah. easy is it for people to get? Like, have you got it on sale? Uh, it's, anywhere it's on my website. Yeah, it's on my website. It yeah, is, so eh? At, at iantyson.ca, not .com. That's a country singer. You won't be able to get my book on his website. Um, Here, you know what? So it's uh, www. Uh, Ian Tyson .ca. So if you go onto my website, there's there's two sections to my site. There's educational speaking and corporate speaking. On either of those, you go to the shop page or just down at the bottom. There's a section to to buy my book, and it comes on there. I get a notification. I'll sign it and send it off to you. I just sent six books off last week. Um, from people that had bought it or uh, at the event that I did, there was a few giveaways. So I sent some of those off. But yeah, it's um, I love it. I did have an ebook version and somebody actually ordered one of those last week. But unfortunately, I had, to, I had a hard drive crash on my computer about a year and a half ago. Oh. And uh, I lost everything, including my ebook. And this reminded me, geez, nobody's bought an ebook in a long time because <laughs> this person ordered an ebook. And I went, oh, no. I don't have my ebook anymore. So I emailed a, a few past customers to see if I could get them to send it back to me. Nobody got back to me. So I just sent them a hard copy anyway, and then took the ebook off my website. So it's not for sale anymore. But uh, yeah, it was. I What's mean, look, your I, feeling? I, sorry, Ian. Sorry, well, go ahead. I was just going to say, and I was really proud of the fact with the self publishing that I did it all locally. So I, I wrote and edited myself, had a couple of other people take a look, and I used impressions printing here in St. Thomas uh, with a buddy of mine from high school. And they, they were able to produce, you know, a proper paperback. It's beautiful and at a really great price. And so, yeah, doing things locally and doing things for yourself, I think is fantastic if you're able to. That's incredible. Now, have you thought at all about the audio book format of it or no? Is that not something that's crossed your mind? No, I've thought about it, but I think in order to do that, and now is certainly the time I can look at it, um, I, I probably want to make some edits to the stories. Yeah. Because some of them, my my thoughts on some of these these things have changed. But what I would probably do it is maybe more of a, uh, I guess they would call an unabridged version. Um, there, was, uh, there was a book, whose was it? Uh, Sidney Poitier's uh, autobiography. I believe it was called Measure of a Man, which is an, it's an amazing book and it's his life story. 
And I know that they said, I read this, that, you know, maybe his book was 300 or 400 pages, his story. But if you listen to the audio book, if it was translated to text, it made the book more like six or 700 pages because he just went off and told stories while wow. he was doing the audio book. And it's fantastic. But that's probably what I would end up doing. If I did an audio book, I'm sure I would be reading along and then I'd just go off on tangents. So it'd probably end up becoming a, a much longer piece, which is okay. I'm totally fine with that. That's wild. Now, yeah, you being a speaking... Something. Sorry, go ahead. I just said, so that's that's probably what would happen. Yeah. Now, you being a speaking professional, Ian, in the times that we're in right now, how are you reaching out to people to get gigs or to make sure people know who you are and what you do? Are you going on podcasts? Are you What kind of things are you doing to generate some hype about who you are and what you do? Well, certainly doing things like podcasts like this certainly helps with the, the audience that Awesomepreneurs has. And when I get opportunities to go on things like podcasts, I'm happy to. I recorded one yesterday uh, for the Thames Valley School Board. I kind of mediated a conversation between my best friend who's a principal and a dear friend of mine who's a speaker and an author who's really about physiology and things like that, Dr. Greg Wells. So I mediated that conversation, but that also gets gets my name out there, which is great. I'm emailing. I mean, I'm thankful in uh, in the industry that I've got a lot of repeat customers. So I'm emailing out to them and saying, hey, what do you think? Is this something we can do? Here's what I'm set up for. And just trying to keep my name out there. That's really the biggest thing. But rattling the chains of all my past contacts, speaker friends of mine who have said, you know, hey, would love to get you in for this gig. The thing I just realized, and I don't know why it's taken me eight weeks to realize this, but I'm someone who, you know, I require a work visa to go speak in the States. Yeah. And that's about a five to six thousand dollar US investment. And so my visa had lapsed and I hadn't got a new one yet because I didn't have enough work to justify that. As a friend of mine on the phone yesterday said, he goes, dude, the border's gone. <laughs> I can I can do speeches anywhere now and kind of build up that 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 client base and not have to worry about crossing the border because I'm I'm doing it from right here. So that's something I'm going to be leaning in hard on as well is, is going after some of these uh, in the educational market, teachers and leadership advisors that I know well uh, that have always said, well, when you get the visa back, we'd love to have you come down. Well, I can come and do a presentation now because I don't have to come anywhere. I'm right here. That's so super cool. That's I think cool that's thing. a really like, positive you know, thing. Yeah, I mean, it opens up the entire world for you. My market is huge now, whereas it was maybe a little more limited. Like, yes, I've been fortunate enough to speak across the states. Um, and in Europe, I did a gig in Mexico last year. I've, I've spoken down in uh, Brazil. Those are all great things. But now I can do those without having to fly anywhere. All they need is a solid Internet connection, and we are golden. That's wild. That's so incredible. I love hearing stuff like that. Again, it's all about the positive things that are coming well, out of COVID it. right now instead of the negative news that we're all watching. For sure. And that's what's what next we've got for to you. Do. What's next for me is continuing to just uh, really go after those three pillars. Um, I'm continuing to build out some things on the cooking end. Uh, I'll be shooting, I'll be doing a cook tonight and shooting another episode of The Confined Kitchen, which I do on YouTube and on IGTV on Instagram. And I post it on Facebook because um, I'm just, in, I'm enjoying that process. I'm cooking anyway. Might as well share some of the skills. And I'm looking to find some opportunities that might exist even within combining the food and the skill set. I have with speaking and, uh, you know, looking at maybe some some hosting things I might be able to do as well. I'm uh, continuing to work on things on the nerdy end. My uh, two of my friends and I have a little our own little group we call Fan Dominion, and we've started um, getting paid to host Comic Cons around Southern Ontario. So wow. we've we we host and have since the second year of the Four City Comic Con in London, we've hosted been the, the hosts and MCs for that Comic-Con. We hosted the Windsor Comic-Con last year. Genre Con in Guelph, we're looking at what could we maybe do online, uh, doing some interviews and stuff like that. And then obviously, first and foremost, continuing to go after the stuff in the motivational speaking world, putting my content out there, seeing what the market's going to bear in terms of presentations, and just trying to keep to spread the positive any way I can by doing things this way. Beautiful. I love it. 
That, yeah, this has been so cool. I really pride myself on the fact that we have an amazing community of coaches within Awesomepreneurs. So if somebody, if the members are watching this and they see this, how can you help them up their speaking game or their presentation game? I know a lot of people are terrified to speak in front of a camera, or in front of a crowd. Are these things that you can help our members work through? Absolutely. I mean, now is certainly the time if it's a speaking in front of a crowd thing that you want to work on, we can start to develop those skills and do the back end work now while we have nothing but time to to really lean in on how do we take because where I can really uh, help people out, I think, given my skill set and, and what I've built up over the 30 years and 30 plus years in the business is to take, here's a presentation, here's some information that I want to get across. What I can do is help you add some story and some impact to that so that it comes across like you're just telling people a story. We can talk technical skills in terms of, you know, holding a mic and how, where, how and where to look in an audience and, you know, all the stage craft of things. But we can also build story, uh, you know, adding story to a, a pitch for investors, for example, if you've got if you're a, a tech startup and you're trying to to do something new. OK, how do we take the the business aspect of this presentation that you want to do, add a little story to make it a little more of connection, may make people more likely to invest. Um, in what you're doing, those kinds of things, adding story to your pieces is something I can absolutely do. And as much as I'm learning in, uh, you know, at the same time as everybody else, I can certainly talk about the tips that I've picked up in terms of looking at a camera and doing a presentation and trying to help people to navigate those waters right now, because I'm feeling more and more comfortable every time I do this. There are a few little tech tips and a few little mental tips that you can do in terms of being able to look at that camera deliver something with impact and to still try and make that connection. So that's something I can absolutely do. But I love talking shop. I love talking, speaking, discussing story. Really, like, I, I love nothing more than when speaker friends of mine say, hey, I'm trying some new stuff. Can I hop on a Zoom or a Skype call with you and work it out? Or can you come and see me present and then give them notes afterwards? And, and I do the same with them. Nothing better. That's wild. I love that. You know what, Ian? I know you're a busy guy. I'm going to let you get back to your day. I want to thank you for spending this time with us. And I want to make sure everybody knows on the bottom ticker there, folks, is all Ian's contacts. You can email him. You can go to his website, check it out, check out his book. Uh, I'm really thankful to have you with us today, Ian. And we're going to be able to see you once we get back to doing live events. For sure. So I want you to take care of yourself. Too. You as What's well, my friend, you take care. And I'm telling you, Kyle, you know this. With my confined kitchen speaking or uh, cooking show I'm doing, I've told you this before. A lot of the time when I'm prepping these meals on camera, I'm thinking, okay, would Kyle be able to do this? <laughs> so you're part of my motivation here, buddy. I need you to lean in. Let's get you cooking. You don't need any more drive through brother. Let's exactly. get you cooking, man. Come on. Go back to episode one and start from the beginning. Foundational skills, we're going to get you there. Thanks so much, brother. I appreciate it. And we'll talk soon, man. You bet. Take care. Take care. Thanks, everybody.